Welcome to Understand the Math. This video is part of a series of videos on linear algebra and its applications and covers section 1.2 on row reduction and echelon forms. I'll teach you all about the eight topics listed here. And by the end of this video, you'll feel confident working these types of problems on your own. Be sure to check out the link below for free guided notes that you can highlight and fill in as you watch this video. Let's begin by learning all about row echelon form. Row echelon form is just a way to arrange a matrix so that it can be used to determine the existence and uniqueness of a linear system. That means you can use it to determine if it has no solution, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. And it's the first step in solving the linear system. It's also called echelon form, and that's the term I'll typically use. The French word echelon just means the step of a ladder. When a matrix is in echelon form, it's non-zero entries, such as the ones that I've outlined here in purple, resemble an inverted staircase. A matrix in echelon form is not unique. Let's underline that. A matrix can have many different echelon forms. To recognize if a matrix is in echelon form, we need to know what a leading entry is. A leading entry is the leftmost non-zero entry in a non-zero row. The leftmost non-zero entry in the first row of this matrix, as we go from left to right, is 1. And in the second row, as we go from left to right, the leading entry is 8. This matrix has two leading entries, and they're equal to 1 and 8. To recognize if a matrix is in echelon form, we also need to learn the three properties that define an echelon matrix. The first property is that all non-zero rows are above any rows of all zeros. This just means that zero rows are at the bottom. For our second property, each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. This means that leading entries are down and to the right. The third property is that all entries in a column below a leading entry are zeros. Another way of saying this is that zeros are below each leading entry. I would suggest that you memorize these properties. Let's now look at an example where we're given four matrices and asked to determine if they're in echelon form. Since our first matrix has no zero rows, we'll begin by circling the leading entries and checking if they're down and to the right we can see that they are indeed down and to the right. Let's now check if there's zeros below these leaning entries. We have zeros below this one and a zero below this one. This means that this matrix is in echelon form. You might wanna stop the video and do these next three on your own. Our second matrix also has no rows of zero, so we'll begin by circling the leading entries. You can see in this matrix that our leading entries are not down and to the right, so this matrix is not in echelon form. Let's look at our third matrix. This matrix does have a row of zeros, and they're at the bottom, so that first property is satisfied. Let's now circle the leading entries. These leading entries are down and to the right, so this matrix is in echelon form. Let's now look at our last matrix. We have no rows of zero, so we'll begin by circling the leading entries. And you can see that these leading entries are not down and to the right. If we switched rows one and two, they would be, but as it's written, this matrix is not in echelon form.
Let's now talk about reduced row echelon form. If a matrix is in echelon form, it also may be in reduced row echelon form or will be called just reduced echelon form. Reduced echelon form is a way to arrange a matrix so that it can be used to solve a linear system and understand its properties. A matrix in reduced echelon form is unique. Let's underline that. Because it's unique, it can be used to solve a linear system. A matrix in reduced echelon form has five properties. A matrix in reduced echelon form will also be in echelon form because it has properties one, two, and three from echelon form. It also has two additional properties. The fourth property is that the leading entry in each row is one. You can think about this as the leading entries are equal to one. The fifth property is each leading one is the only non-zero entry in the column. This means that the matrix will have zeros above and below each leading entry. And this fifth property makes sure that there are zeros above each leading entry. Let's now look at another example where we're given four matrices, but this time, we need to determine if each matrix is in reduced echelon form. We'll begin with the first matrix. It doesn't have any row of zeros, so we'll begin by circling the leading entries. The leading entries are down and to the right. Let's now look at the zeros. There are zeros below and above the leading entries. Lastly, the leading entries are equal to one. Because of this, this matrix is in reduced echelon form. Just like with the previous example, I'd suggest you stop the video and see if you can determine if these other three matrices are in reduced echelon form. Let's look at our second example. No rows of zero, so we begin by circling the leading entries. Let's now check for zeros. We have zeros below the leading entries. However, we don't have a zero above this leading entry. And because of this, our matrix is not in reduced echelon form. Let's go to number three. No rows of zero, so we'll circle our leading entries. Let's now look at the zeros. We have zeros below the leading entries and we have zeros above the leading entries, and our leading entries are equal to one, so we'll write a yes because this matrix is in reduced echelon form. Let's look at our last one. We do have a row of zeros, and it's at the bottom, so we're good with that. Let's now circle our leading entries, and you might notice right away that our leading entries are not equal to one. So this matrix is not in reduced echelon form. Just for completeness, let's go ahead and highlight the zeros. I want you to notice that in example two and four, even though the matrices were not in reduced echelon form, you can see that they are in echelon form. Hang with me, we just have a few more definitions to learn before we can learn the row reduction algorithm. Let's learn what pivot, pivot positions, and pivot columns are. A pivot position is a location in a matrix that corresponds to a leading entry in the echelon form or reduced echelon form of the matrix. A pivot column is just a column that contains a pivot position. And then lastly, a pivot is an entry in a pivot position. To find pivots, pivot positions, or pivot columns, we first need to reduce the matrix to echelon form, and then we just need to circle the pivot positions. We'll be able to better understand these terms by walking through this example problem. 
we're asked to reduce the matrix to echelon form and then circle the pivot positions in the final matrix and in the original matrix and then list the pivot columns. Just like we did in the video on section 1.1, we're going to start with the entry in the upper left and get zeros below that. To get rid of the four, we'll replace row two by row two minus four, row one. And to get rid of the six, we'll replace row three with row three minus six, row one. This is the matrix we get when we do both of those operations. Let's now circle the next leading entry. Before we go about getting a zero in this position, we need to do some simplification. It will help a lot if we simplify row two by dividing it by minus three, and then simplify row three by dividing it by minus five. This way we'll avoid working with fractions. When we do this, we end up with this next matrix. Our leading entry is now a one, and we can now go ahead and easily get a zero in the row below it. To get this one to be a zero, we're going to multiply row two by negative one and add it to row three. This gives us this matrix, and this matrix is in echelon form. Let's circle our pivot positions in this final matrix, and then we'll translate back and circle the pivot positions in our original matrix. We now need to list the pivot columns. This is column one, column two, column three, and column four. Our pivot columns are then column one, column two, and column four. Let's write that down. We now have all the tools that we need to learn about the row reduction algorithm. This algorithm is called Gauss-Jordan elimination. It's just a procedure for reducing a matrix to echelon or reduced echelon form. It has four steps, and steps one through three reduce the matrix to echelon form, and then step four reduces the matrix to reduced echelon form. Let's now go over the steps. When completing steps one through three, we'll work down and to the right. We'll begin with the leftmost non-zero column, identify a row that has a non-zero entry and will be easy to work with, and then move that row to the top by interchanging rows if it's not already at the top. Then circle the pivot and make it a one if it will help. For our second step, we'll use row replacement to create zeros in all positions below the pivot. In step three, we'll move to the next column to the right. I'll show you exactly how to do that in our example and repeat steps one and two after excluding the row or rows above it. We'll then repeat this process until there are no more rows to modify. These three steps produce a matrix that is in echelon form, and these steps are called the forward phase. In the fourth step, we'll work up and to the left, and we'll create zeros above each pivot. And lastly, we'll make each pivot a one if it isn't already. This step produces a matrix in reduced echelon form, and it's called the backward phase. Let's put all of this in practice by walking through an example problem. We're asked to use Gauss-Jordan elimination to reduce a matrix to reduced echelon form. We'll start by looking at the entry in the upper left corner of the matrix. Notice that it's a zero. Because of this, we'll need to interchange row one with either row two or row three. We could choose either one of these rows to interchange with row one, and I'll choose row two. So we're going to take row one and interchange it with row two. That gives us this matrix. We'll now circle our pivot in the upper left 
and we need to get zeros below that pivot. So this entry needs to become a zero. To do that, we'll replace row three with row three minus row one. I think it's often helpful to write a negative one here so that we can see visually that we're multiplying that first row by negative one and adding it to the third row. This gives us this matrix. Let's now move to the next column to the right and circle the pivot. Notice that if we were to use this pivot, we would have to multiply row two by a one third, and we would introduce a fraction when we got to this term. So let's do another thing first. Let's divide row three by negative one or multiply it by negative one, and then let's interchange rows two and row three. That way, we'll have a one to use as our pivot. This is the matrix that we get. Let's now circle our pivot and then highlight the entry below that because that's the entry that we need to make equal to zero. To do this, we're going to replace row three with row three minus three times row two. We'll put a negative three here because we're multiplying row two by negative three and adding it to row three. This is the matrix that we end up with. Let's make a note that this matrix is in echelon form. So we completed the forward phase of the algorithm. Now we're gonna start with the backward phase. So we're gonna circle our pivot and then highlight the entries above that pivot. We need to make those entries equal to zero. We're starting the backward phase of the algorithm where we're working up and to the left. We're going to multiply row three by negative one and then add it to row two. And then at the same time, we're going to multiply row three by minus eight and add it to row one. When we do both of those steps, we end up with this matrix. We're almost done. We'll circle our pivot. Sometimes I think it helps to go ahead and circle this one as well, so you can see that this pivot was the next one that we needed to work with. Let's now highlight the entry above it, and we're going to make that one equal to zero. To do that, we're going to multiply our second row by seven and add it to our first row. This gives us this next matrix. Let's go ahead and highlight all our pivots. We have this one, this one, and this one. You can now see that this pivot is not equal to one, so we need to make it equal to one. To do that, we're going to take row one and we're gonna divide it by three. This gives us this final matrix. This matrix is in reduced echelon form. Our pivots are all equal to one, and we have zeros above and below each pivot. Now that we understand how to do the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm, we can use this algorithm to solve a linear system of equations. When solving linear systems of equations, we need to understand whether a solution to that linear system exists and if it does, is it unique? That's called existence and uniqueness. As we saw in the previous video in this series, a linear system of equations can have one of three types of solutions. It can have no solution, exactly one solution, or infinitely many solutions. If it has no solution, it's called an inconsistent linear system, and if it has exactly one solution or infinitely many solutions, it's called a consistent linear system. In that previous video, we looked at these three linear systems and saw that the first one had no solution, the second one had one solution, and the third one had infinitely many solutions. We're now going to see that the echelon form of a matrix can determine the existence and uniqueness 
of solutions to a linear system. I've written all three of these linear systems above in an augmented matrix in echelon form, and I circled the pivots. In all three of these augmented matrices, the left-hand side of the matrix is called the coefficient matrix, and then when we look at the entire thing, it's called the augmented matrix. In our first augmented matrix, notice that the coefficient matrix has a row of zeros and there is a non-zero number on the right. Whenever this happens, we're going to have no solution. In our second augmented matrix, notice that every column in our coefficient matrix has a pivot. Whenever this happens, our linear system will have one solution. In our third augmented matrix, notice that there is a column without a pivot. When this happens, we will get infinitely many solutions. In a few minutes, we'll learn how to write a solution to a linear system of equations that has infinitely many solutions. Let's now look at a classic example where we can really see if we understand what an augmented matrix looks like when it has no solution, a unique solution, and infinitely many solutions. In this example, we're going to choose H and K so that this linear system will have no solution, a unique solution, or infinitely many solutions. Whenever we do this type of an example, the first thing that we need to do is take the augmented matrix and put it in echelon form. Because remember, when a matrix is in echelon form, we can determine what type of solution it has. We're going to circle the pivot in our first column, and we'll get a zero below it. To do that, we're going to multiply row 1 by minus 4 and add it to row 2. When we do that, here's what we get. Our first row stays the same, and then our next row becomes 0. We have a minus 8 plus h, and then we have a minus 12 plus k. Let's now see what h and k should be so that we have no solution. We're going to have no solution when we have a row of zeros equal to a non-zero number. To get a row of zeros, we're going to have to take minus 8 plus h and set it equal to 0. And then to get a non-zero number on the right-hand side, we're going to have to set minus 12 plus k not equal to 0. This gives us h is equal to 8 and k is not equal to 12. To get a unique solution, we're going to have to ensure that every column has a pivot. Our first column has a pivot, and then we're going to have to make our second column have a pivot. To do this, we have to force minus 8 plus h to not equal 0. This gives us that h is not equal to 8. For our linear system of equations to have infinitely many solutions, we're going to have to have a column without a pivot. Let's again highlight our columns, and we'll circle our pivots. Column 1 already has a pivot, so we'll have to make sure that our second column does not have a pivot. So we're going to say that minus 8 plus h is equal to 0. And then to make sure that we don't have the case of no solution, we're going to have to require that minus 12 plus k be equal to 0. This gives us the answer h is equal to 8 and k is equal to 12. Since this problem is so complicated, I would suggest that you go back and make sure that you can do this problem on your own. We're now going to see how to find and write the solution of a linear system of equations that has infinitely many solutions. 
As we saw on the previous page, a linear system such as the one shown here has infinitely many solutions because it has a column in the coefficient matrix that does not contain a pivot. We can see why there are infinitely many solutions to this system by reducing the augmented matrix to reduced echelon form. Since our augmented matrix is already in echelon form, all we need to do to put it in reduced echelon form is to make this one a zero. We do that by replacing row one with row one minus row two. That gives us this augmented matrix that is in reduced echelon form. To see how to write the solution, let's first take this augmented matrix and write it back in terms of our variables. We have x1 minus x3 is equal to 3, and then we have x2 plus 4x3 is equal to 2. This linear system has two equations and three unknowns. Let's now go over the standardized method that we're going to use to solve this linear system. This method is to solve for the basic variables in terms of the free variables. The basic variables are the variables that correspond to a pivot column. In our matrix that's in reduced echelon form, we have two pivot columns, so our basic variables are going to be x1 and x2. Free variables are variables that do not correspond to a pivot column. The third column in our augmented matrix does not contain a pivot, so x3 is going to be our free variable. Let's write this again down here. When we solve for the basic variables in terms of the free variables, we'll be solving for x1 and x2 in terms of our free variable, which is x3. Looking at this system above, we can see that x1 is going to be 3 plus x3, and x2 is going to be 2 minus 4 x3. x3 is our free variable, so we'll just write x3 is free. We can also write our solution as 3 plus x3, 2 minus 4x3, and x3. Let's now spend a few minutes learning about Gaussian elimination. Gaussian elimination is just another method to solve a linear system of equations. With Gaussian elimination, we reduce the matrix to echelon form and then use back substitution to find the solution. Gaussian elimination is used often when you're working with a large system of equations and need to be computationally efficient with your computer algorithm. In the video on section 1.1, we solve this linear system of equations using the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm. Now we're going to solve it using Gaussian elimination. We start by putting our matrix in echelon form, which I've shown here. If you want to see the steps on how I got here, you can look at the video from section 1.1. We're now going to use back substitution. To see how this works, let's go ahead and write this matrix in terms of x1, x2, and x3. We get x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 is equal to 8. That's from looking at the first row of the matrix. The second row tells us that x2 minus 5x3 is equal to minus 9. And then the last row tells us that x3 is equal to 2. Let's highlight that x3 is equal to 2. Now we're going to get the value of x2. We're going to substitute x3 back into our second equation and get x2. We get x2 minus 5 times 2, plugging in for x3, is equal to minus 9, and that gives us that x2 is equal to 1. We'll now plug x3 back into equation 1 and also plug x2 
back into equation one. That's going to give us x1 plus 1 plus 2 times 2 is equal to 8. That then gives us that x1 is equal to 3. And we can write our solution as 3, 1, 2. In this course, we're going to be using the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm, but I just wanted to show you real quickly what the Gaussian elimination algorithm looks like. Let's now look at an application problem where we'll use the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm to create an interpolating polynomial. Our interpolating polynomial passes through the points 112, 215, and 316. To find this interpolating polynomial, we'll begin by setting up a system of linear equations that follows the equation y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Our first equation will be from plugging in x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 12 into our polynomial. y is 12, so we say 12 is equal to a, x is 1, 1 squared is 1, so we have a times 1 plus b, x is 1, so we again have a 1, plus c. For our second equation, we're going to plug in that x is 2 and y is 15. We have 15 is equal to a times x squared, which is 4, plus b times x, which is 2, plus c. And then for our last equation, we're going to plug in x is equal to 3 and y is equal to 16. So we have 16 is equal to a times 3 squared, which is 9, plus b times 3, plus c. Let's go ahead now and rewrite these equations. We have 12 is equal to a plus b plus c. We have 15 is equal to 4a plus 2b plus c. And then lastly, we have 16 is equal to 9a plus 3b plus c. Our next step is to take this linear system of equations and put it into an augmented matrix. We then go through the Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm. I've listed this here, but I'm not going to go over the steps. And we end up with a solution for A, B, and C. Our A is equal to negative 1, B is equal to 6, and C is equal to 7. We'll write that down. We have a is equal to negative 1, b is equal to 6, and c is equal to 7. This gives us the interpolating polynomial y is equal to a, which is negative 1. So we have a minus x squared plus b times x, which is our 6x, plus c, which is 7. You can check to see that this answer is correct by plugging the data points back into it. That was a lot of material, but we got through it. Be sure to check out the next video in this series where I'll teach you all about vector equations. If this video has been helpful to you, please consider subscribing to my channel. Keep believing in yourself and have a great rest of your day.